We shall now look at the third temptation. The first was to help himself in his need. The second, perhaps, to assert the Father. The third, to deliver his brethren. To deliver them, that is, after the fashion of men, from the outside still. Indeed, the whole temptation may be regarded as the contest of the seen and the unseen, of the outer and inner, of the likely and the true, of the show and the reality. And, as in the others, the evil in this last lay in that it was a temptation to save his brethren instead of doing the will of his father. Could it be other than a temptation to think that he might, if he would, lay a righteous grasp upon the reins of government, leap into the chariot of power, and ride forth conquering and to conquer? Glad visions arose before him of the prisoner breaking jubilant from the cell of injustice, of the widow lifting up the bowed head before the devouring Pharisee, of weeping children bursting into shouts at the sound of the wheels of the chariot before which oppression and wrong shrunk and withered, behind which sprung the fir tree instead of the thorn and the myrtle instead of the briar. What glowing visions of holy vengeance, what rosy dreams of human blessedness, and all from his hand would crown such a brain as his. Not like the castles in the air of the aspiring youth, for he builds at random because he knows that he cannot realize, but consistent and harmonious as well as grand because he knew them within his reach. Could he not mould the people at his will? could he not transfigured in his snowy garments call aloud in the streets of jerusalem behold your king and the fierce warriors of his nation would start at the sound the ploughshare would be beaten into the sword and the pruning hook into the spear and the nation rushing to his call learn war yet again indeed a grand holy war a crusade no we should not have had that word but a war against the tyrants of the race the best as they called themselves who trod upon their brethren and would not suffer them even to look to the heavens ah but when were his garments white as snow when through them glorifying them as it passed did the light stream from his glorified body not when he looked to such a conquest but when on a mount like this he spake of the decease that he should accomplish at jerusalem why should this be the sad end of the war Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Not even thine own visions of love and truth, O Saviour of the world, shall be thy guides to thy goal, but the will of thy Father in heaven. But how would he, thus conquering, be a servant of Satan? Wherein would this be a falling down and worshipping of him, that is, an acknowledging of the worth of him, who was the Lord of misrule and its pain? I will not inquire whether such an enterprise could be accomplished without the worship of Satan, whether men could be managed for such an end without more or less of the trickery practiced by every ambitious leader, every self-serving conqueror, without double-dealing, tact, flattery, finesse. I will not inquire into this, because on the most distant supposition of our Lord being the leader of his country's armies, these things drop out of sight as impossibilities. If these were necessary, such a career for him refuses to be for a moment imagined. But I will ask whether to know better and do not so well is not a serving of Satan. Whether to lead men on in the name of God as towards the best when the end is not the best is not a serving of Satan. Whether to flatter their pride by making them conquerors of the enemies of their nation instead of their own evils is not a serving of Satan in a word whether to desert the mission of god who knew that men could not be set free in that way and sent him to be a man a true man the one man among them that his life might become their life and that so they might be as free in prison or on the cross as upon a hillside or on a throne whether so deserting the truth to give men over to the lie of believing other than spirit and truth to be the worship of the father other than love the fulfilling of the law other than the offering of their best selves the serving of god other than obedient harmony with the primal love and truth and law freedom whether to desert god thus and give men over thus would not have been to fall down and worship the devil 
not all the sovereignty of God, as the theologians call it, delegated to the Son and administered by the wisdom of the Spirit that was given to him without measure, could have wrought the kingdom of heaven in one corner of our earth. Nothing but the obedience of the Son, the obedience unto death, the absolute doing of the will of God, because it was the truth, could redeem the prisoner, the widow, the orphan. But it would redeem them by redeeming the conquest-ridden conqueror too, the stripe-giving jailer, the unjust judge, the devouring Pharisee himself with the insatiable moth-eaten heart. The earth should be free because love was stronger than death. Therefore should fierceness and wrong and hypocrisy and God-service play out their weary play. He would not pluck the spreading branches of the tree. He would lay the axe to its root. It would take time, but the tree would be dead at last, dead and cast into the lake of fire. It would take time, but his father had time enough and to spare. It would take courage and strength and self-denial and endurance, but his father could give him all. It would cost pain of body and mind, yea, agony and torture, but those he was ready to take on himself. It would cost him the vision of many sad and, to all but him, hopeless sights. He must see tears without wiping them, hear sighs without changing them into laughter, see the dead lie and let them lie, see Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. He must look on his brothers and sisters crying as children over their broken toys, and must not mend them. He must go on to the grave, and they not know that thus he was setting all things right for them. His work must be one with and completing God's creation and God's history. The disappointment and sorrow and fear he could, he would bear. The will of God should be done. Man should be free. Not merely man as he thinks of himself, but man as God thinks of him. The divine idea shall be free in the divine bosom. The man on earth shall see his angel face to face. He shall grow into the likeness of the divine thought, free not in his own fancy, but in absolute divine fact of being, as in God's idea. The great and beautiful and perfect will of God must be done. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It was when Peter would have withstood him, as he set his face steadfastly to meet this death at Jerusalem, that he gave him the same kind of answer that he now gives to Satan, calling him Satan too. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So saith St. Matthew. They brought him the food he had waited for, walking in the strength of the word. He would have died if it had not come now. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So saith St. Luke. Then Satan ventured once more. When? Was it then when, at the last moment, in the agony of the last faint, the Lord cried out, Why hast thou forsaken me? when having done the great work having laid it aside clean and pure as the linen cloth that was ready now to enfold him another cloud than that on the mount overshadowed his soul and out of it came a voiceless persuasion that after all was done god did not care for his work or for him even in those words the adversary was foiled and for ever for when he seemed to be forsaken his cry was still my god my god 